Walk with me. I am. Thou has been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or over ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return ye, children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, and when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood, they are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourishes and groweth up, in the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger. By thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. Seventy. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet there is their strength and labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. Return, O Yahweh, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto thy children. And let the beauty of the I am, our God, be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Yes, that's Psalms chapter 90. Deliver me from the hands of evil spirits who have sway over the thoughts of men's hearts, and let them not lead me astray, O my God. Establish thou me and my seed forever, that we go not astray from henceforth and forevermore. Jubilees chapter 12 and verse 20, a prayer of Abram. Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, those of you on this platform and those shared platforms. We thank God for you, you, and you, and we give God the praise, yes, for you. And also with a hand clap of praise, we thank God for those of you that have been with us from the beginning and those of you that have been with us thereafter and here and there's about. And we thank God for those of you that have just subscribed. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. Those of you who have just subscribed or followed, we give God the glory and the praise for you. And we thank God for those of you that are about to subscribe or follow, calling those things that are not as though they were. Yes, we have some that they follow, you know, and then they come out and give you an offer. Crypto or something, but the fact is I'm not interested. Please don't waste your time. I'm not interested in crypto or any of those things. But if you have a concern or you have a question or something like that, that's okay. Or you have a comment, that's okay. But as far as this soliciting of these financial products, you have to offer a no, I'm not interested. It seems as though I'm ignoring you. Most likely I am. Because I've been approached by many. But nevertheless, we're in Jasher, as you prepare. Jasher, the book of Jasher, chapter 72, and we're going to begin with verse 1. Moses. Mo there's a little more to Moses than we thought. A little more to Moses than we thought. And there's a little bias in this book also. There's a biasness in this book that is unfounded. We'll point that out as we, when we approach it. We will point it out, the biasness in this book that is really a product of the translator. or Whatever authority by which he decided to put that insert in there, we'll point it out. 
Yes, and we still, our heart goes out to those in Kenya who've lost their loved one in just trying to protest the governmental blundering of their economy. I mean, sometimes it, 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 sometimes you have to meet violence with violence, but these people were not violent at all. They did not have bullets. They didn't have guns. They didn't have anything. They were empty-handed. If anything, they had water to keep each other, should I say, warm. Now, it, was, it would behoove a government, when you have a protest of, of sorts, to organize and say, we will meet with you. Instead of just bottling yourself up inside and saying, you get out, we are your dictators. We are your hierarchy. You have no voice. This is disrespect to the people. This is disrespect to those who pay your salaries and your earnings. And rightly so, the leader and all those involved should be fired. But in some countries and continents, they do not do that. They let them continue even in their folly and their fickled and bombazzled mindset. But you're strong. You're strong. Yes, you're strong. Now that people have been demised because of that, it's time to even get stronger and demand that these people leave and appoint a new leader, appoint a new person, a, a group of people, young, that care for the future of those like them and those younger than them, that have families, that, that want to see people prosper. Yes, not only there, you have South Africa, you, I have no words, but either way, we thank God for those who, leaders that care about the people. That is true democracy when the people can come to you and voice their concerns, whether they come through an alderman or a, or a congressman or whether he meets, the mayor meets with this and that as he meets with the people in the city and the state or whatever your province or whatever have you, the village. And it's all filtering all to this. We do not like this. No. And you never make a uh, decision that's spot on or right then and there and in private when you have millions of people that are or that will be affected. I know it's a big task and all of that, but the economy, that economy in particular, has been raised up because of the blundering of leaders before it. For the leader that you have now, borrowing and borrowing, instead of being innovative and asking the people to come up with visions and, and helping them materialize and construct places where others can be employed. And, ah, uh, that's why I thank God for Mr. Tory. Yes. It's not a fast process, it's a slow process. But apparently, many just want to save themselves and damn the others. Nevertheless, I digress. But it's the story of Moses. There's more to Moses than we have, uh, than we're, we're led to believe in the 66 books. Although the 66 books, even in the New Testament, there are, should I say, things that don't belong misnomers. They are misnomers due to the wickedness of the translators and those that have authority over those translators. Misnomers. You're going to have those misnomers. In other words, as one person says, a YouTube shout out to Kiri Mayo, dodge the hijack. Dodge the hijack. You got to dodge it. And you got to see. And the only way you're going to dodge these things, these misnomers, is you have to read. Stop being lazy. I'm going to call it a buck a buck. Don't be lazy in reading. Sometimes you don't feel like it. 
Maybe you need some vitamins. Maybe you need something to help your brain focus. To focus on the word of God. To focus on that law. When you, when you begin to know this law, you can read anything and, and nothing will sway you. The light of the law. The law shines in darkness because it weighs the love that you have. Well, you say you love a person and you beating them and you, you're, you're, you're laying with another man's wife and you say you love your brother. Hmm? The law weighs that out. And thus judgment. The law has a judgment for all of it. And the law also, God has a sentence once it is judged. Now, Moses, he was appointed over the king of Cush. He was a king of Cush. Moses was a king of Ethiopia or whoever, I believe Cush is Ethiopia. Okay? And it was in those days that there was a great war between the children of Cush and the children of the east and Aram. And they rebelled against the king of Cush in those ha whose hands they were. This is Moses. No, this was not Moses. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So, Kikianus, Kikianus, king of Cush, went forth with all the children of Cush, a people numerous as the sand, and he went to fight against Amram, Aram, the children of the east, to bring them under subjection. Now, this could have been Ethiopia, could have been. Somalia, one of these countries, under subjection. And when Kikianus went out, he left Balaam, the magician. See, this, this Balaam is something else. With his two sons to guard the city and the lowest sort of people of the land. In other words, these are base people, people who didn't care. They, they even dis, disdain for the law, disdain for human existence. They were just the lowest. So Kikianus went forth to Amram, Aram, the children of the east, and he fought against them and smote them, and they fell down and wounded before Kikianus, his people. And he took many of them captives, and he brought them under subjection at first, and he encamped upon their land to take tribute from them as usual. And Balaam, the son of Beor, when the king of Cush had left him to guard the city, the poor of the city, and he rose up and advised with the people of the land to rebel against the king Kikianus, this is evil, was not to let him enter the city when he should come home. And the people of the land hearkened to him, and they swore to him and made him king over them. <clears throat> and his two sons were captains of the army. So they rose up and raised the walls of the city, and the two corners, and they built an exceedingly strong building. And the third corner, they dug ditches without number between the city and the river, which surrounded the whole land of Cush, and they made the waters of the river burst forth. And at the fourth corner, they collected numerous serpents by their incantations and enchantments. See, this is the work of Balaam. They fortified the city, dwelt therein, and no one went out or in before them. And Kikianus fought against Amram, Aram, the children of the east, and he subdued them. Before, and they gave him their usual tribute, and he went and returned to his land. And when Kikianus, the king of Cush, approached his city and all the captains of the forces with him, they lifted up their eyes and saw that the Walls of the city were built up and greatly elevated, so the men were astonished at this. And they said one to another, It is because they saw that we were delayed in battle and were greatly afraid of us. Therefore they have done this thing and raised the city walls and fortified it, them so that the king of Canaan may not come in battle against them. Now this is Hamites against Hamites. As one to note. These are Hamites. All of these are Hamites. King Kikianus, he was a Hamite. The king of Cush, Hamite. All right. So the king and troops approached the city door, and they looked up, and behold, all the gates of the city were closed, 
And they called out to the sentinel, saying, Open unto us that we may enter the city. But the sentinels refused to open them, and by order of Balaam the magician, their king, they suffered them not to enter the city. And they raised a battle with the opposite of the city gate, and 130 men of the army of Kikianus fell on that day. Verse 17. And on the next day they continued to fight, and they fought at the side of the river, and they endeavored to pass, but were not able. But some of them sank in the pits and died. So the king ordered them to cut down trees to make rafts upon which they might pass to them, and they did so. And when they came to the place of the ditches, and the water revolved by mills, and they, two hundred men upon ten rafts were drowned. And on the third day they came to fight at the side where the serpents were, but they could not approach there, for the serpents slew of them 170 men, and they ceased fighting against Cush, and they besieged Cush for nine years. No person came in or out, or out or in. Now, at that time the war ceased, and the siege were against Cush. Think, Moses fled from Egypt. <clears throat> from Pharaoh who sought to kill him for having slain the Egyptian. And Moses was enlightened with 18 years old. This is an 18 year old boy, Moses, fleeing. So his teenage Moses. Now, how did he get from that point to where he got? He was, it's, it is said that he was 80 years old. Something had to happen between the time here that he fled and when he finally met up with the daughters of Jethro. Now, Moses was 18 years old at this time, and when he fled from Egypt, I'm in verse 22, from the presence of Pharaoh, he fled and escaped to the camp of Kikianus, which was at the time being sieging, besieging Cush. And Moses was nine years in the camp of Kikianus, king of Cush, all the time that they were besieging Cush. And Moses went out and came in with them. Now, if this man was that which we, you know, your, your status, you say white, why is he with Cush? This book was put, pushed out. Now, there are some misnomers in this book, but the fact is, is that it was pushed out because of one, this one very reason that a person could note that if he was going to be identified with the people of Cush, he had to be looking just like the people of Cush. The people of Cush were not like the Edomites who hired people that did not look like them or did not, was not of their people. But Cush, they're not going to do that. <laughs> Ah, blew you away. <laughs> yes, you you definitely blow away. <laughs> I'm telling you, that is something else. You say Egyptians were this see you have to realize in this thing this was a whole thing set by not only Arab and Western nations to take over from the river of Egypt all the way to Morocco. They took from the Euphrates all the way to the brook of Egypt. This was given to them to confuse you as to what the nation or the nations look like in that area, the nations of Shem particularly. And these were Hamites. Mr. Raim were Hamites all the way even into the U.S., what we call the U.S. today. Hamites. They were not white. They were, as you described, black. They were not Arab looking. They were, as you describe, as black. Period. This is why they got rid of this book. They didn't want this book. No, they didn't. They didn't want that book. These so-called, I ain't saying all the people are like that, but I'm saying they have deceived many into thinking that these 
Egyptians and Cushites or Hamites look like those that have come from the north or as the status put white or from the Caucasus Mountain there is no way historically gene genetically or nothing that Moses or the children of Egypt or even the children of Jacob all the way into Morocco, all the way into the United States were as many have put this thing. And they have put a misnomer in here that might get a, get, get a hold of something, so I'm going to warn you. And Moses was nine years in the cup, 24, and the king and princes and all the fighting men loved Moses. I mean, this 18-year-old boy was something else. I mean, who could not like him? For he was great and worthy. His statue was like a noble lion. His face was like the sun. In other words, he would just light up the place when he came. It's not that he was white or he was Arab looking or whatever. It's just he was just one person that, you know, he had a he was sunshine. You know, it was just a joy to be around. And his strength was like that of a lion. No, he was not like he was not a lion. He was a human being of the children of Jacob. And he was counselor to the king. See, God had given his wisdom. He was raised in the house of Pharaoh, and he knew the ways of Pharaoh. Okay? And at the end of nine years, Kikianus was seized with a mortal disease, and his illness prevailed over him and died on the seventh day. So his servants embalmed him and carried him and buried him opposite the city gate to the north land of Egypt. So that, therefore it takes you, not only Moses was involved with the children in Egypt, but he was also involved with Cush. They don't want you to know that. Okay. And so, him, he carried away a bird. Now see, you, you have these years between the time that he left of silence. See, the 66 books which were written by Greeks or translated by Greeks. And this here was part of it too, but they had to come up with something. But either way, and this is probably where you get the mindset of the colonizer. The mindset of supremacy. Yes, this is the mindset from this book. So they had to get rid of it. They made it disappear for many. And only those who could obtain it had to have some. Now it's everywhere. So his servants embalmed him and carried him and buried him opposite the city. Gate to the north of the land of Egypt and they built over him an elegant and strong and high building and they placed great stones below and the king scribe engraved upon those stones all the might of their king Kikianus and all his battles which he had fought behold they are written there this day yes they are in Cush Cush should have these writings now after the death of Kikianus king of Cush it grieved his men and troops greatly on account of the war. So they said one to another, give us counsel what we are to do at this time, and we, as we have resided in the wilderness nine years away from our home. See, this is why it's so important. That, I mean, young minds, but you, you have to really, young minds will listen. They have new ideas, and if you have a humble elder staff or elder council, that will listen to this young mind to rule and to come up with ideas that will help even advance your country or your civilization or your, your, your even your continent. Young minds are better because many of us old people, we just, many of us sit in our ways. Many of us have been tainted with the mindset of colonization and for many it, it's hard to shake and to take and not give so therefore if we say we will fight against the city many of us will be wounded will fall wounded or killed and if we remain here in the siege we will also die so now all the kings of Am Am 
Aram of the children of the east will hear that our king is dead. Now this is this is Moses' mortal enemy that had done this to build up the walls and have moats even Balaam. They will attack us suddenly in a hostile manner and they will fight against us and leave us no remnant, no remnant of us. No, we're no prisoners. Now therefore let us go and make a king over us that and let us remain in the siege until the city is delivered to us, up to us. And they wish to choose on that day a man for the king from the army of Kikianus. And they found no object of their choice like Moses to reign over them. <laughs> this man is moral to you. Of the tribe of Levi. A man of law. A man of order. This is what Levi is about. Law and order. Not biasness. Not brutality, but law and order. Yes. Now. And they hastened and stripped off each man his garments and cast them upon the ground. And they made a great heap and placed Moses thereon. And they rose up and blew with trumpets. And called out before him and said, May the king live, may the king live. And all the people of the nobles swore unto him to give him a wife. Adoniah, the queen, the Cushite, the wife of Kikianus. And they made Moses king over them on that day. And all the people of Cush issued a proclamation on that day saying, Every man must give something to Moses of what is in his possession and they spread out a sheet upon the heap and every man casts into it something of what he had one had a gold earring and the other one a coin also of onyx stones and bdellium pearls and marble did the children of Cush cast unto Moses upon the heap also silver and gold in great abundance and Moses took all the silver and gold and all the vessels and bdellium and onyx stones which all the children of Cush had given him, and he placed them amongst his treasures. Now, the name Moses is probably not what he's called in their language. But Moses had to learn so many languages, even with those of the children of Mitzrayim, he, in order to even talk to the Pharaoh or the king of Egypt. He learned, or God given him those languages to understand and to speak. Now which all the children of Cush had given him and he placed them amongst his treasures. And Moses reigned over the children of Cush on that day in the place of Kikianus king of Cush. We're going to continue on for a few minutes. In the 50th year of the reign of Pharaoh king of Egypt, that is in the 150th year of the Israelites going down into Egypt reigned Moses and Cush. And Moses was 27 years old when he began to reign over Cush, and 40 years did he reign. And the I am graded Moses' favor and grace, the same thing, in the eyes of all the children of Cush. And see, these, these, these colonizers that wrote this, uh, some of them, some of them meant well, but they. Uh, that's why one reason when our people were slaves in the land, they forbid them to read. They, it wasn't the common man; it was the ones in the religious hierarchy didn't want them to know really who, the, our people to know really who they are and their history, and they wanted to give their people a certain understanding of their uh, false standing. Now this is what happened. And the I am granted Moses favor. Okay, and Cush loved him exceedingly, so Moses was favored by the I am and by men. And in the seventh day of his reign, all the children of Cush assembled and came before Moses and bowed down to him to the ground. And all the children spoke together in the presence of the king, saying, Give us counsel that we may see what is to be done to this city. For now it is nine years that we have been besieging round about the city and have not seen our children and our wives. In other words, Balaam got them locked in. So the king answered them, saying, If you will hearken to my voice and all that I shall command you, 
then the I am will give the city into our hands. Because God was with Moses, and we shall subdue it. For if we fight with them, as is in the form of battle which we had with them before the death of Kikianus, many of us will fall down wounded as before. Now therefore, behold, here is the counsel for you in this matter. If you will hearken to my voice, then the city will be delivered in our hands. And also all the forces answered the king, saying that all our king shall command that will we do. And Moses said unto them, Pass through the pass through a proclamation, a voice into the whole camp unto all the people, saying, Thus says the king, Go into the forest and bring with you of the young ones of the stork, each man one in his hand. And any person transgressing the word of the king who shall not bring his young one, he shall die. Now spiritually we know that an angel had given him this revelation. And the king will take all belonging to him. And when you shall bring them, they will be in your keeping. And you will rear them until they grow up. And you shall teach them to dart upon, as is the way of the young ones, of the hawk, you know, was to rush fast. So all the children of Cush heard these words of Moses, and they rose up and caused the proclamation to be issued throughout all the camps, saying unto all the children of Cush, the king's order is that you shall go together and to the forest and catch there the young storks, each man his young one. You got to remember, most of this land was not desert at that time. Most of it was green, luscious, and I mean, beautiful land. And you shall bring them home. And any person violating the order of the king shall die. And the king will take all that belongs to him. Now Moses was rough now. Moses just wasn't no, he was a meek man. One thing about meekness. Meekness don't have to show off in nothing. When you're meek, you're not a show off. You might have the muscles and... You might have the skills of a ninja warrior or a samurai or you might have the skill in arms and battlements and all these things or big like Goliath. But a meek man knows his limitations and he knows what he can do. A meek man knows that he can pulverize a weak man or a weak man usually is one that hollers off at the mouth. A fool. But a meek man says, I'm not going to even make myself even be bothered by this fool. Now, a meek man can be, can be caused to make angry, but it takes a lot. But one thing about a meek man, he knows his worth and he knows what he's capable of. So he does not need to boast it nor display it. And those around him will understand and those who know him know what he's capable of. And verse 18, and all the people did so and they went out to the wood and climbed the fir trees and caught each man a young one in his hand and all the young of the storks and they brought them into the desert and reared them by the order of the king. And they taught them to dart upon similar to the young hawks. And after the young storks were reared, the king ordered them to be hungered for three days. And they were starving. And all the people did so. And all, on the third day, the king said unto them, Strengthen yourselves and become valiant men. And put on each man his armor and gird on his sword upon them and ride each man his horse and take each young stork in his hand and we will rise up and fight against the city and the place where the serpents are and all the people did as the king ordered and they took each man his young one in his hand and they went away and when they came to the place of the serpents the king said send forth each man this is what Moses said send forth each man his stork upon the serpents and they sent forth each man his stork this is the mindset of a of a young man. He understood. He probably. It might have happened when he was young. Who knows. But he was given knowledge of how this should happen. And it had to be the I am that given him this knowledge. Yes. 
And they sent forth each man his young stork at the king's order, and the young storks ran upon the serpents, and they devoured them and destroyed them out of that place. And with that, you stay tuned. We're going to give you that. If you read on, it's okay. You're going to see something in there that you're going to say, whoa, I didn't think about this. But this is the mindset of the colonizer. It's going to come. It's going to come. I'm going to show you this. And this is why many people think that those of darker hue, of the darkest hue, should be beneath them. And they can show you this. Some of them can actually show you this scripture that really is a misnomer. Who wrote it or how it was put in there, I do not have a clue. But it has been put there, just like the badger skin in the book of Exodus. But things are there, and the only way you can spot them is you have to know the law. You have to know the prophecies. You have to know these things. You don't have to know what scripture or what chapter or verse they're in, but you have to know when you hear, you have to know the word that when you hear something that's out of harmony with God's word or his law, it, does, it strikes a sour pitch in your heart and your mind. This is the way that you, it'd be, you, the word of God dwelling in you richly. Now, with that, we're going to say shalom and peace. Walk with me.